Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where we study the scripture using expositional inquiry, whereby we take the books chapter by chapter. And you have to know, if you believe in the inspiration of the Word of God, when you study the scripture chapter by chapter, you are accessing a level of narrative that is absolutely lacking in topical Bible study. Topical Bible study is when the speaker takes a peppering of verses throughout the scripture, puts them together in a cohesive format, and presents a message on a particular subject. Uh, that is not illegitimate, but that subject and the gathering of those topical verses is it is necessary to have inspiration from the Holy Ghost to do that. Don't you expect your pastor to be inspired mm -hmm. to put together that message? Uh, and of course we do, but let me ask you a question. Uh, no matter how inspired your pastor is or the speaker that you're listening to giving a topical message such as I just described, is his inspiration equivalent to or greater than the inspiration of Scripture? I think, obviously, the answer would be no. That's not to put down or to denigrate the inspiration of an anointed minister or speaker to put together a message. My point being is the Scriptures, as we study them, are put together by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit at a level that it produced the infallible Word of God. Amen. Not just particular verses, but the entire corpus, the entire body of Scripture. And therefore, when we study it as it was intended to be presented, I'm not talking about the order of the books, uh, but as we go chapter by chapter and study an entire book, you gain access to a narrative that God intended for you to be exposed to, that you will never touch any other way. Mm -hmm. And so we experience something. You access something that is of great value, which is why Paul told Timothy, give attention to reading. When you give attention to reading, you're gaining access to a deeper narrative. And a narrative that is not just concocted by man's thinking. A narrative that was included, it was folded into the inspiration of the scripture, when the original authors wrote these things down, moved upon by the Holy Ghost, a narrative that is as infallible as the Bible itself, because it is the Bible itself. And that narrative, what does it do? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. There is a faith that comes through Specific verses. Let me tell you something. There is an abiding faith. There is a deeper dimension of faith mm -hmm. that is activated in your heart and life when you gain access to the narrative, mm -hmm. to the tapestry that those verses are hung on. And that, thus we do chapter by chapter, verse by verse study of the Word of God. And today we're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Come out from among them. Is it wrong to have an us versus them mentality as Christians? Most preaching today would count this as an immature viewpoint. They would say that's not helpful. Uh, in chapter 6 here of 2 Corinthians, however, Paul stresses that we must embrace the idea of separation from the world as the basis of our connection to God as our Father. Right. Not just for the matter. It really strikes me, the last verse in our chapter, he says, if you will do this, I will be your Father and you'll be my children. Well, if we don't do it, and this goes back to what we talked about uh, yesterday, about we call it the orphan spirit, that's the sanitized expression, but the Bible calls it uh, the curse of the bastard that doesn't enter into the house of his God to his tenth generation under the old covenant. In other words, if uh, uh, Paul is making the point that the concept of separation, living a separated life, and we'll touch on some of what that might mean, 
Uh, it produces a level of sonship in us that's not accessed any other way because in producing sonship in us, it's by bringing us into proximity to the fatherhood of God at a level that will never be experienced any other way if we believe what this chapter is saying to us. Mm-hmm. And and when I study these things that are so so far afield from how modern church culture addresses these things, so far afield as to be in stark contradiction to it, then the thing that the Holy Spirit echoes back to me says, Russ, you have to make up your mind if you believe this or not. Amen. Whether it's popular, whether it's convenient, whether it's avant-garde, whether it's GQ, mm-hmm. whether it's what all the cool kids are saying, and do are we going to go with what all the cool kids are saying, or are we going to listen and respond to this narrative? And if and And this narrative produces something in us that cannot be accessed any other way. Mountain, moving, faith. Amen. So we're going to begin, Kitty, if you would, by reading the entire chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in a day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, and in fastings, By pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the word of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. You are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Now for a recompense in the same I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temples of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. In verse 1, Paul implores the Corinthians that they receive not the grace of God in vain. And He starts and says, we then, then what? Because of what he's been saying about not handling the word of God deceitfully, not being like Moses, who wanted to appear to be something that he was not. He didn't want the people to see when the glory faded. He said, don't fall for it. Don't get into this situation. This, The scope of this context of don't receive the word of God in vain uh, covers the last three chapters, all dealing with false teaching, and false teachers deceiving the people into looking to man for what they ought to look to God for. We are to remember that man does not save us. He says, don't receive the grace of God in vain. For he said, I have heard you. Who? It's not important that man hears you. God heard. And in a day of salvation, I have helped you. In other words, we have to know where, like, this is what David said. It was so ridiculous. <laughs> We say, I'll look to the hills when it's come with my help. And and we say, oh, yes, we're looking to the No, the hills is where ritual prostitution and pagan worship went on. 
mercy. When David made the statement, he says, am I going to look to the hills to get my help? He says, no, my help comes from the Lord. Amen. Are we going to look to the high places? I say to you, my brothers and sisters, are we going to look to the high places? Oh, we don't have high places. What are you talking about? You sit in front of a high place every Sunday. You're on the floor and you're looking up to a high place. Yeah, but, well, we have, listen to me. I understand that. But there's another aspect of this we need to hear. Are we going to look to the high places? Is our help on the platform or is our help from the Lord? The guy on the platform better get it in his head that he's there to activate, enlarge, and bring worship to who Christ is in you, not who Christ is allegedly on the platform. Amen. The one who is aggrandizing the Christ or the anointing that's on the platform to the eclipsing of the Christ that's in the heart of man that person is an idolater and he's in league with demons. Strong language. Strong. I tell myself every morning before I do morning light, be calm, Russ. <laughs> just just present the information. Just relax. <laughs> take a breath. I, I don't know how to do this dispassionately. That's right. I really don't. It stirs me up. Uh, so in the day of salvation, it's, God and not man who has saved us. Therefore, we should not think of a man more highly than we ought. Somebody says, well, do we get rid of the plan? No, there's something called the law of the existing ordinance. We don't want to tell anybody to stop doing it that way because that creates its own set of problems. We just don't want to do it that way anymore. And the answer is not, as a lot of young pastors, well, we just need to put all the chairs in a circle. Well, that doesn't help either. We're not looking at outward structure. Amen. See, we treat the church like an insect. Its exoskeleton is on the outside. We're always trying to rearrange the outside. It's, it's what says inwardly you're full of dead men's bones. You've got dead men's structure. When we need a living structure, Amen. producing a living something that, that enlarges. What am I talking about? Go read Revelation. When we get to Revelation, we're going to find about, out about 24 elders around the throne is Jesus enthroned on your heart you have 24 ribs encasing your heart and four chambers crying holy 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 mm he's -hmm. talking about that temple and worshiping at that temple of which most people have no concept of because they only perceive spiritual things in terms of God's linear purpose through time looking for a fleecy white cloud and a planet called heaven without understanding whatever that is is only a reflection. It's only a shadow of the substance that Jesus said, don't look out there. It's on the inside of you. Amen. So as ministers of the gospel, our goal, verse 3, is give no offense. Tell that to the guy who delights to offend people in the pulpit. And he gets standing ovations when he does it. Yes. He has excised, verse 3, 2 Corinthians, from his canon. Why? Because it brings the applause of the people. That's why. Giving no offense, I'll say no unnecessary offense, in anything that the ministry be not blamed. And I would say unnecessarily blamed. Does this mean that if we're criticized or if people are offended that we delegitimize our ministry? Some people think so. No, because the counterbalance to this statement is found in James, James 1 and 2. My brothers, be not many teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation, for in many things we offend all. So there's the counterbalance. Do we approve ourselves? He starts talking about how we get approved. In all things, approving ourselves. How do we get approved? We approve ourselves as ministers of God, through patience, in much patience, in afflictions, necessities, distresses, stripes, imprisonments, tumults, labors, watchings, fastings, pureness, knowledge, long-suffering, kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love and fame, the word of truth, the power of God, the armor of light, honor and dishonor, evil and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown yet well-known. So he's calling for the ministers of God to show much patience. I know a lot of ministers that are unknown and they have no patience. How do I know that? Because they come into our spiritual footprint 
that represents Father's Heart Ministry, and they try to poach what God has given us to draw away disciples after themselves. Quite frankly, we could say a lot about that, but the bottom line is they're just not patient. But we, the patience we display under fire, God, Paul calls for ministers of God to show much patience in affliction, necessities, distresses, stripes, imprisonments, tumults, labors. If you properly examine the statement, it is the patience and not the suffering that constitutes God's approval. It's important to point this out because many teach that suffering is a necessary part of the call. Suffering is not a necessary part of the call because Jesus suffered so we don't have to. However, suffering is often, and universally so, a consequence of the call. Oh, I'm, I'm called to suffer. Why? You're a sinner. You deserve anything you get. So it, it is incapable for you to suffer for somebody else. Because if you suffer, it's like Clint Eastwood said in the movie, he says, we've all got it coming, kid. You know, he says, oh, I'm, I'm suffering for Jesus. People do that with loved one get sick. Oh, God, put that sickness on me. Why? Like you don't deserve it also and 10 times worse? We cannot enter into the efficacy of the suffering of Christ. And the doctrines that try to suggest otherwise are very self-righteous in nature. Listen, if you are suffering, it is your patience that brings the approval of approbation of heaven over your life. On the other hand, sometimes suffering on the part of a leader tends to cause followers to pull away. Why do you think um, Bobby Doherty, I think the name is? Billy Joe. Billy Joe Doherty had cancer, died of cancer, and the week he died of cancer, after his death, is when his congregation found out he had cancer. He never said a word. Why? Because he was smart. He knew that his ministry would suffer if people found out he had cancer. That's a very sad indictment mm -hmm. upon Christian culture. It's true. Many times, because people are undergoing difficult circumstances, people pull away. That also is wrong thinking. Leaders are human. And to expect them to live lives without pressure or challenge, that constitutes idolatry. Paul declares in Acts 14.22 that through much tribulation or pressure, we enter the kingdom. If you are pressing into the kingdom, you will face difficulty. The question is, will you demonstrate patience? If you are patient in the pressure zone, Acts 14.22, you will break out into the kingdom. Amen. The servant of God also receives heaven's approval by pureness, by knowledge. People do this all the time. No, no, I don't teach doctrine. No, no, I don't teach doctrine. I teach the simple gospel. Well, it's for the simple, but it's not for the stupid. Do you know the difference between those who are simple and those who are stupid? People that are stupid don't want to learn, don't think they ought to be required to learn. Listen, when Jesus came into your heart, he did not cut your head off. He expects you to give yourself, oh, just don't ask me to think so much. Well, if I was going to hold a seminar, guaranteed how you will win a $1 billion lottery, guaranteed or your money back, or I will give you a billion dollars, you would come, you'd have, a, you'd have a recorder, you'd have a stack of notebooks, you'd have some nice sharpened pencils, you would get the DVD, you would buy the book, you would do whatever you had to do, you would sit for hours, hours on the end. It's all about motivation. Our, our estimation of the value of the content and the trouble it takes to absorb it is all relative to what we think we're going to get out of it. And so we expose our hearts many times times. And so we prove ourselves by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. Man, I'll never forget, we, we were looking for a church to attend here in the area. And we, we attended this church several times. And the pastor finally had some interaction with us. And he really had a lower estimation of people. He, he thought he had a high estimation of himself and a low estimation of the people. Because, I mean, this guy looking me in the face, it was like looking at a possum with that big old grin. 
looking right through you, not listening to a word you were saying, but shaking your head and clapping you on the shoulder. He thought that his feigned love was part of his skill as a pastor. It was the last time we went. I absolutely knew that wasn't where we needed to be. We attend a church where Pastor Tim, of, of all the men I've met, this man is a classic pastor. He has mm-hmm. a pastor's anointing on his life. Mm-hmm. He, 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 he gets in the pulpit. I've never seen him teach that he didn't, ha- he didn't have genuine emotion on his face. I've uh, seldom seen him minister that he didn't cry. Right. And he's and I could tell by watching him and watching him and his family, his wife. He he's not a crybaby. He's not some super uber sensitive guy. He's he's just a regular Joe like everybody else. But something about that anointing on his life, Amen. his love is not unfeigned. So how do we demonstrate kindness? Many times preachers and teachers are resoundingly unkind in their preaching, claiming they are just telling you like it is. But unfortunately, they are applauded by their congregations for doing so. One of the most bold preachers I, we personally interact with right now is Apostle Ricardo Watson. Oh my goodness, that man is a Holy Ghost howitzer. <laughs> and he says things that will absolutely shock your religious sensibilities. But the thing I love about him is he is saturated with humility He's saturated with the love of God, the compassion of God. In the midst of teaching some very bold things, the compassion of God, the love of God, the grace of God just flows through him, and you feel his love, and you feel his compassion, even upon those that he's correcting, even upon those that he is correcting in a very pronounced way. So... The minister of the gospel, he's also proved by God, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor. Oh, you have dishonor in your life, brother. You can't, you can't be in the ministry. Well, why are you telling him that? Sometimes people will say that to a minister because that ministry makes them uncomfortable. Sometimes it who it's who God is in that ministry. It's like I had a friend of mine one time that was come against because of an error in his life. And God told me, he said, they're not going after him because of the error. The error is the pretext. It's the anointing on his life that makes them uncomfortable and they want to destroy him and they're using the error in his life to do it. Mm-hmm. So he's proving by honor or by dishonor as deceivers and yet true, you're deceiving the people. As unknown yet well known. Now here's a, another contradiction between God's idea of leadership and man's. Men tend to follow leaders who are popular and well thought of. I, I've heard people say this. Well, I've never heard Bill Johnson say that. I've never heard Mike Bickle say that. I never heard Chuck Pierce say that. What was the point? They're deriding somebody, and it wasn't directed at us. They're deriding somebody because they're unknown. There's a large part of reception that we get now simply because we're not unknown. Now, we're certainly not well-known. I wouldn't really describe us as well-known, but we're not unknown. You know, there are people that, that at some point or another, vestigially so, our name has come across them, and when they hear our name, it's not completely, absolutely unknown. In some circles, not in even in many circles, but in some circles. And because of that, we get a receptivity that we didn't get before. Well, guess what? I was, we were just as anointed when people were looking at us sideways because they didn't know our name. They feel like whether or not they know us is, is a uh, metric for whether or not we are called of God. So no, whether we're known or whether we're Unknown. Sometimes in laboring in obscurity, you take the path less traveled, which constitutes the will of God for the leader God has chosen you to be. And could we tell the difference if God wanted you to connect with that leader? Listen, it takes no faith at all to hang on every word of a popular leader who sways the masses. The heart of discernment, however, is to hear the word of the Lord from those who are unknown and unsung. The point Paul is making is that the Corinthians were looking down on him and refusing to accept his ministry because they were immature and they were small-minded. 
in verse, verses 11 and 12, he cries out to them. He says, my heart is enlarged towards you, but you are straightened in your bowels. Kitty asked me right before the, uh, the Bible study, what does that mean? To be straightened in their bowels, it means they were spiritually constipated, which is interesting because several days ago, God spoke to me about that, about some people, he said, have spiritual constipation. <laughs> they need an enema. <laughs> they were unwilling and unable to process Paul's message because Paul wasn't worth their time and they didn't respect him in the first place. So regardless of their lack of kindness and respect toward him, here's the heart of a papa. Paul implores them, I implore you as a father speaking to his children. What was on his heart? And then up comes this message. Here's something that, that just pops up. And you, you wonder, he's like he's changing the subject, but this is what he's been driving at. It says that they be not unequally yoked together, verse 14, with unbelievers. Now, this is more than Paul. We say, yeah, that's right. Uh, Non-Christians and Christians shouldn't get married. We write it off. Well, how convenient for us. Certainly, unbelievers should not marry believers, and believers should not marry unbelievers. The Corinthian church was a church. It's, it's much more than that. The Corinthian church was a church without necessary boundaries, regarding its commitments and relationships where the world was concerned. We are in the world, yes, but we are not to be so caught up in worldly affairs and relationships that we cannot extricate ourselves and live separate lives. Now, what concord hath Christ with Belial? So again, he, he brings it up to the demonic. There is a spirit. There is a personality. It isn't just godless humanity out there. There is a demon. There's a demonic entity with a personality and an agenda working in the lives of those who do not have a born-again experience. I don't care how sweet they are. I don't care how nice they are. What real part can a believer have, Paul asks the question, with an infidel? Now, this message of separation, it's not a strong theme, as putting it mildly, in the current climate of Christian culture. Paul, on the other hand, questions what agreement does the church as the temple of God have with idols? Well, no, it's not with idols. I just, this guy's my partner in business. It's how I make my living. No, you don't understand. That's my family. Those are my grandkids. Those are my neighbors. Uh, we're doing this to bring people into the church, are we now? It has been said we're not to question those around us whether or not they are believers or not, but instead just ask whether or not they are advancing our agenda. Let me say this again. Wow. The church is in bed with ungodliness, and the pretext, and they're getting nods of affirmation, applause, and standing ovations for saying it. Don't ask whether we're connecting ourselves or partnering ourselves with godliness or ungodliness. Just ask whether or not they're advancing our agenda. Now that's a sila. Pause and meditatively think about that. If a person has a, question, a Christian testimony or not, it doesn't matter, it's alleged, so long as they're working in our favor. And that's the thinking of the Japanese art of war. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Did Jesus write that? No, he didn't. In the light of Paul's statement about separation, that supposition doesn't hold true. Paul says we are to come out from among them, capital them, T-H-E-M, them and be separate. Well, who are they? Well, you better be finding out because you're expected to come out from among them. Yet preaching today as a consistent theme says that we as believers, we are wrong. We've heard, I've heard it my whole Christian life. We're wrong to have an us versus them mentality. I understand the logic of that, but does that hold up as being consistent with Paul's statement here? And if not, how can we make the correction or do we even want to? Well, you know, that was Paul. And Paul didn't get everything right. I hear this all the time talking to pastors. 
Yes, I know what the Bible says, but, ah, we are redacting our canon. You know, there are so few people that actually have 66 books in their Bible. And the epistles of Paul, for most people, looks like Swiss cheese. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't like this. We like this part, but we don't like that part, and et cetera, et cetera. See, one way, how do we make, if, if you have any... Now, you can be intellectually honest and spiritually dishonest. If you have any spiritual honesty, you have to ask yourself, if I'm going to come out from among them and be separate, who are they anyway? We better be finding out. Oh, I don't want to make a mistake. Ah, so we perish living lives of mixture because we don't want to make a mistake. I would rather make a mistake in pursuit of, of compliance to the apostolic mandate of heaven than to sit back and refuse to take a stand and suffer because of it. One way to find out who the them are that we're to come out from among, who are they and why would we want to come out from among them? Because if we do, here's why. Listen to this, this last verse. Saying, well, you know, yes, I understand. We need, you know, you need... He says, come out from among them, be separate. Touch not the unclean thing. And I will be a father to you. So if we're not coming out from among them, and if you don't have people, places, things, relationships, circumstances, and situations that stand out in stark detail to you, when we read that verse, I would suggest to you, you're not doing it. If I say, touch not the unclean thing, and there are not, uh, there's not a whole litany, an inventory of things that you say, yep, not touching that, not touching that. If, you, if there are not specifics, if there are not things explicit to you that just stand out, yep, that's what that verse means to me. I submit you're not doing it. Well, I know I'm, try, I'm, I'm a good person. Yeah, that's what the sinner says, claiming he's going to go to hell, though he doesn't believe in Jesus. Well, what's, what are the stakes? He said, I will be a father to you. And so if we're not doing it, he won't be a father to us. Back to the bastard spirit. And the bastard will not enter into the presence of God to his 10th generation. And we're going through, through garbage and saying, God, where are you in all of this? He looks at it and says, yeah, I get it. You won't let me be a father to you. Why? Because I said, come out from among them, but they're talking about my grandkids. Lord, that's my job. That's my business partner. To what lengths do I have to go? God, surely you wouldn't ask me, touch not the unclean thing. Well, I've had a hard day. I'm just trying to cope. See, all these things we allow, all these margins we allow for ourselves. He said, if you will simply embrace what he's saying, he said, then I'll be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters. And then he says, says the Lord Almighty. But if we don't do those things, see the words are two-edged sword. If he will be this to us, if we will comply, then he won't be that to us, the two-edged sword, if we don't comply. You can be born again. He's not your daddy. You can be born again and you're not going to be his son or daughter because you're not in compliance. Am I saying you're not saved? No. Some are saved though as by fire. And you'll get to heaven and, and the Lord's going to look at you and say, knucklehead. Like my mama said, we live so far beneath our privileges. What am I saying then? We need to find out what does it mean? Come out! Some of you that means you got you to gotta leave that church you're in. And you know you do. You've been like Lot in Sodom. You've been attending First Church in the city of Sodom, and you're there for all kinds of reasons. And some of you, if you obey Second Corinthians six seventeen, you're going to quit going to that church. Some of you are going to go put in your two weeks' notice at work. Some of you are are going to have an empty chair at the Thanksgiving table because you're not going to be showing up because you cannot go among them. Oh, you high-minded hypocrite, you. I know that's what they say. But are we going to comply or are we not? What a great, ready for the holiday message. 
Jingle bells, jingle bells. Right. What's the message for the holidays, Brother Walden? Come out from among them, be separate, touch not the unclean thing. Oh, that isn't what that means. Well, of course it is. And I, I, I'm not volunteering to suggest to you where you're not in compliance, but I will suggest to you that compliance exists. And we are either in compliance. Sometimes we're one of the non-compliant brethren. Well, what stream are you flowing in? This year, brother. Well, I'm flowing with the non-compliant brethren. <laughs> then the Lord just says it to me. It's like this mantra. Russ, you have to make up your mind if you even believe this stuff. And if we do, we're accountable. Great message God told me in 2015. God says there's poison in the pot. I said, what is it, God? It's when I saw all of these major men of God that died of a head wound, beginning with David Wilkerson, who was decapitated like John the Baptist. And all of these powerful men of God. And the Lord says, Russ, there's poison in the pot. Now, I'm not saying they were this, this because they died. No. A criminal could put poison in your drink and you drink it. It means you're, doesn't mean you're at fault. I said, God, what's the poison in the pot? And he said, unaccountable sons. And what's the solution? Well, we have to have a father. We have to have fatherhood brought forth into the earth again. Someone who's going to stand up in the anointing of heaven and bring accountability back online. Oh, that shepherding error. No, it's not. Nobody in your church is that submitted. God's bringing apostles back online in the body of Christ. And in mercy and grace, God is speaking something to us that doesn't matter what I say, means nothing what I say. What does matter is this is the word of God. And are we going to comply or not comply? What's our heart? My heart would be, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lord, I'm compliant, help my uncompliance. Mm -hmm. And then go from there. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, I thank you for your truth. Yes, true. Lord, we are clean through the word that you speak to us. It's like an astringent. Sometimes, Father, it's caress, beauty bar. Sometimes it's steel wool and lye soap, whatever it needs to be to bring us release, to bring us into the place that you are to us a father. Oh God, we want you to be a father to us that we might be your sons and daughters. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.